What number are you? Should be working. Yeah. Try connecting the microphone. Um, I've now done the new rotor that starts at the beginning of October and takes us through to, well, over, over the winter period. I'm afraid I'm unable to send it all out to, in emails to everybody because that's just beyond me. Um, but I have got it printed up and it is on the board out the front there. And there are a few photocopies if people want to take them home, but it is always on the board. Please check it and see, you know, where you are. Um, I think it's a very worthwhile job because people like to see a friendly face and it's nice to have the door opened for you. Um, if you are unable to do the Sunday that I've put down, could you please just ask somebody to do it for you or change with somebody else that's on the rotor so that we're always covered and there's always two people out the front to say hello. Um, I think that's it. Oh, it's a worthwhile job. And if anybody else wants to do it, please let me know. I'd be pleased to sort of put you on the rotor. It's only once every couple of months. So it's not a great hardship. And you don't have to be here until at least half past ten that's gone, you know. So anyway, thank you very much for listening. Are we better now? Yes. Great stuff, thank you. Um, so welcome, I'll start again. Welcome if you're a visitor. And I don't want to embarrass them, but a special welcome for those that haven't been here for a little while due to other reasons. So welcome. And uh, thank you. Let's just spend a moment just to take a breath. I trust you've discussed the weather and all the other important things we often discuss before we start our service. And we're going to, as we remain seated, sing this lovely song. Open our eyes. Remain seated.
Father, we just ask that that will be true of us this morning. That you will help us to open our eyes to what you want to say. That you will help us to open our ears. And Father, we just thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, whose work it is to help us to understand who you are and what you want from us. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you in our midst this morning, asking that you will work in each of our hearts. Father, we thank you for Jesus and the fact that he hung on a cross for us, that we can come and say sorry. And Father, we do that now, that we may clear our slate, that there may be no barriers from us hearing from you today. So we pray, Father, that you will forgive us for all our misdoings this past week, whether they be in thought, word or deed. We lift them to you. Jesus, thank you that you hung on that cross. Thank you that you rose on that third day to conquer the devil and all his works. We thank you that we have been promised if we come to you and confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins so that each of us may now walk up to the throne and spend time with our Heavenly Father and with you in worship praise this morning. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand to sing, Jesus is King, I will extol him. Let's stand. Please be seated and Colin's going to bring us our reading. From Acts 4, 23 to 35. The believers pray for courage. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. 
When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O oh, Sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against the Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand, with healing power, may miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then, they preach the word of God with boldness. The believers share their possessions. All the believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Thank you, Colleen. Shall we stand, if you're able, to sing again, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let's stand. Thank you.
Please be seated. Father, as we spend a few moments just looking at these verses, we just ask that through your Holy Spirit, you will help us to understand what our task is here, to help us how to be your church, to help us how to be a better church. In your name we ask it. Amen. Amen. The last time I spoke in June, um, I'm going to have to ask Arthur if he would flick up a few things for me. Thank you, Arthur. We asked the question, why are you here today? And we took that passage from uh, um, Matthew where Jesus went into the synagogue at Nazareth. And we looked at their reaction while they were talking about the things they thought were good. They were quite happy. But how soon as he started mentioning things that he wasn't happy with, they threatened to stone him and he had to walk away. I'd like to ask another question if I may. Thank you, Arthur. Why do we exist as church? Why do we exist as church? There was a survey done by um, a church consultant, whatever a church consultant is, I haven't any idea. And uh, he surveyed a thousand churches. And uh, 89% of the congregations, the fellowship, whatever we want to call them, 89 of them thought that church was for them. That the role of the pastor was to look after them, to make sure that uh, no one else got out of the pen of the church, and that was what they wanted. Only 11% of those congregations thought that the purpose of the church was to win the world for Christ. Which for me is sad because it goes against that great commission that Jesus gave us, thank you Arthur, where Jesus, some of the last words he said on this earth before he ascended into heaven, he said, therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. The interesting thing was uh, that the pastors of those same churches, thank you Arthur, the pastors of those same churches, 90% of them thought that the church was to take Jesus into the world. And only 10% thought that they should keep their ha family happy. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that we as a church shouldn't be family. We should, very importantly, as we'll look at in a minute. But, of course, the main reason, surely, we are church is for those out there not necessarily for us. While we're working for them out there, yes, we should love and care for each other, 100%. So, in our reading today, um, in the chapter before, thank you, Arthur, in the chapter before, um, Peter was on the way to the temple. And he was on his way, the, the chapter 4 says, as his, was his custom to pray in the temple. On the way there, that uh, he met the crippled man sitting at the gate, beautiful. And uh, he said, um, the, the cripple asked for money. Peter said, silver and gold, have I none? Um, what I have, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Always reminds me of that Sunday school song. Skipping and jumping and praising God. Anyway, we won't go there. Um, so Peter healed this cripple. And this cripple did literally jump, praise, leap, all the things, went round the district and caused havoc, chaos. Because he 
was able to prove that Jesus was alive. The authorities didn't like this, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin didn't like it, so Peter and John were yanked in before them, and they were given a lecture and all those things. And when they came back, the disciples, the people were praying, and they prayed those prayers that we heard them praying. Persecution had started. One of the things that history has taught, when God moves, the devil moves as well. We don't like to talk about it. I call him sooty face. It sounds less Vincent Price-like, if you like. Um, but when God is on the move, the devil is also revived and will be on the move. And that's what our early Christian friends found. There's some amazing sermons uh, within that passage that we read, but I would just like to focus for a minute or two on verses 32 and 33, because there's one or two things in there that shows us what church should be, what we should be as church. The first one, they, there was unity in the church. If you note the reading, it was all believers, all believers were united in heart and mind. Not just the leaders, not just the deacons or the elders, but all believers were united in heart and mind. Unity takes some keeping. <coughs> And we'll look at that again in a minute. The second one we note, they were family. They had come to the point in their life when they realised that all that they had was not necessarily theirs, it was the Father's. And therefore they had no problem in sharing them. Materialism didn't matter to them. They were, their goods, all they owned was God's. So they were able to share them. They were able to be family. Next one, please, Arthur. They knew why they existed. They existed. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here we have three points we have the church being united. We have the church being a family. And we have the church preaching the gospel. And what do we find? The next one, Arthur, please. They experience the power of God. And God's great blessing was upon them all. God's great blessing was upon them all. Now, the scholars tell us, and how they work it out, I don't know. But uh, the 120 who were in the upper room, by 25 years later, was, uh, they reckon the church in Jerusalem was 100,000 people. Because God, what God saw in the church, he was able to bless what God saw happening in his church, he was able to bless. But that leads to another question. Whose church is it? How many times have I said, it's my church? Whose church of it? Listen to these words. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I will build my church. I wonder how many times in my life, sadly many, that I've dictated what I wanted to happen in my church. Well, actually, it's not mine. It's Jesus' church. How many times have I mouthed off about something before praying and asking what Jesus wanted to happen? How many times has the person standing next to me done the same thing and the person next to him done the same thing? So we now have three different ideas of what should be happening in Jesus' church. Personally, I can't begin to imagine the horror of having nails rammed through my finger. I can't begin to imagine what it must be like for Jesus on that cross. Sorry, elders, the table's all right. But Jesus hung on that cross to begin church. To begin church. He hung on that cross to invite me into his church if I ask for my sins to be forgiven. He hung on that cross because he loved me and he loves you. And yet, how many times have I tried to take over his church? How many times through history has I, the I syndrome, crept in? So now we don't only have Baptists, Methodists, Anglicans, so on and so forth. When Jesus just wanted his church. In John 17, we have that amazing prayer that Jesus prayed. And listen to these words in John 17. Thank you. I always say this, I invite you all to close your eyes and just imagine Jesus praying this last prayer to his Father before his fate. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you love me even before the world began. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't pray that his church would be a great success? He didn't pray that everybody who went to church would be happy. He didn't pray that we would have all we would need in possessions. What did he pray for? His last prayer. What did he pray? That we would have unity. Why this sermon, Pete? 
I honestly don't know. It's not my sort of sermon. You know me. I love to take a story and expand a story. On the other hand, I also know that this church has been praying for eight months now and we've had some amazing times of prayer together. And I also know that the Heavenly Father is going to work some of those prayers through us, both in here for us as well as out there. I also know that as the Father starts moving through the power of his Spirit, sooty face, the devil, will try and get in. And I also know how many times the devil has got in through the lack of unity because the spirit cannot work when we are not, as the early church was, of one mind and of one heart. Folks, we've really got to work at our unity. We've got to get rid of the I syndrome and find out what Jesus wants. We won't all get the right minister. He won't, not all of us will have the right worship. Not all of us will be able to do all the things we want. But this is not our church. It's his church. So we must find out what he wants. We were praying in there before the service, asking that God's will be done with the right minister he or she to come. Hallelujah. We want the right one here who can take us out there. And we must all have the same vision. Folks, forgive me for saying this, we are not a social club. We are here in the name of Jesus to make his name out there. Yes, we would do it in numerous different ways, whether it's everything from holiday, hobby popping, uh, the Chatterbox, lost it for a minute, Chatterbox, or whatever else, community lunch, and so on. These are all ways for us to open up the opportunity to give the gospel to them out there. And when they come in here and find us that we are a real family, we are all of the same mind and of the same heart, then not only will they like what they find, but the Father will be able to bless us. We keep praying, don't we? Release your spirit. And we mean it. We really do. But he'll only be able to release it if he finds that the circumstances are such that the spirit can work freely. And of course, unity starts with each one of us. Unity starts with us losing the I syndrome and putting the Jesus syndrome. Unity then becomes a collective thing. Let's not let sooty face get in. Let's really pray that we will go for unity. Let's really be willing to give up some of those things that we might like for what Jesus wants. And in the end, it will work out the best for all of us. Wouldn't it be wonderful if 25 years' time this church was stacked out at 100,000? <laughs> Can't see it. But you know what I mean? The Father has the power. The Spirit is with us. Each of us has his Spirit in us when we became Christians. So everything set up as long as we keep focused on what Jesus wants. And of course, what Jesus wants, the Father will bless. I think I've said enough, haven't I? I'm getting passionate. But I'm passionate. This is God's church. And we should rejoice in the fact that he who made the seas, the heavens and the earth is interested in little homelands. Because he is. Right down to the last detail. But we've got to find out what those details are. doesn't mean to say that we haven't got to use common sense. It doesn't mean to say that we've got to sit back and just wait till it happens. Of course it doesn't. He's chosen to use us. 
May we glorify him for allowing him to work through us in all humility and all unity. For I'm building a people of power. I'm building a people of praise. How's he going to do it? Through my spirit. Build your church, Lord. Make us strong, Lord. Join our hearts, Lord, through your Son. Make us, Lord, one body in the kingdom of your Son. Let's stand if you are able to sing. Jesus knew that his death was just around the corner. But in his final prayer, he didn't pray for himself, but for the disciples' unity. He prayed for their love for each other and that they also gave their love to others. For all these who would come to be his followers. Jesus prayed that we should be one, unite together, unity. Let us pray. <coughs> Father, we want that unity. United we stand, divided we fall. We ask you, Holy Spirit, for your strength and power, a power beyond our comprehension. Build in a people of power. Yes, Father, not our power, but the power of the Holy Spirit. For I'm making a people of praise. Father, you deserve such wonderful praise. That you will move through this land by my spirit. Father, we bring to you at this moment those people of yours, persecuted Christians all over the world, tortured, ignored, persecuted to the point of death just because they believe in you and your love. 
Father, we want to glorify your precious name. No lies, deceit, gossip, spiteful, being spiteful or hurting other people's feelings. Help us with the help of your power, the Holy Spirit, to be kind, thoughtful, making allowances for each other's mistakes, smoothing troubled waters, keeping unified, asking for each part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <coughs> Help us, Holy Spirit, to work on the part or parts that we lack in this wonderful <coughs> gift that you give us, just for the asking. We give you praise and thanks for everything. And as the psalmist said, we will praise you as long as we live with singing lips our mouths will praise you. We praise you, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. And may we honour your Son, Jesus, by responding to his last prayer when he prayed not for himself, but for his disciples' unity. He prayed for their love for each other and that they also gave their love to others. Jesus prayed that we should be one, unite together, unity. Father, May we honour your son's very last prayer. Amen. Thank you, Carl. Let's stand to sing, if we're able, our last him, King of Kings, Majesty.
Father, we thank you that we live to serve your majesty. We thank you that Jesus and you are majestic beyond what we can imagine. And yet, you are interested in every detail of our lives. May we leave this place knowing that you will walk with us each step of this coming week. May we leave this place full of your Holy Spirit that we may reflect and live out the fruit of the Spirit. And may you glorify yourself and your Son through all that we do as the church community here. That yes, Lord, you will bring others in because we have taken you out. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I wonder if uh, just something a little different, if um, Arthur, could we have um, our building a people of power um, and can we rather than say the grace to each other can we sing it to each other because we are to be the people of power. So let's just try that shall we just look around as we sing these wonderful words and then hopefully the coffee will be ready. Okay. It's coming. <laughs>